It's easy to sketch something that's four-dimensional, especially the four-dimensional equivalent of a cube, which is also known as a tesseract. Start by drawing two squares, slightly offset, and then connect their corners by straight lines. This can be visualized as a perspective drawing of a cube, the squares being separated in our mind's eye in the third dimension. Next, draw two cubes joined at their corners. With 4D vision, we'd be able to see this as two cubes separated in the fourth dimension, in fact, a perspective of a tesseract. Unfortunately, flat representations of 4D objects aren't much help to us in being able to see them for what they really are. The English mathematician and teacher Charles Hinton, whom we met in the previous video in this series, realized that a more fruitful approach to training our minds to see in four dimensions might be through three-dimensional models that could be rotated to show different aspects of a 4D shape. At least that way we'd be dealing with only a perspective of the real thing, rather than a perspective of a perspective. To this end, he developed an intricate visual aid in the form of a set of one-inch wooden cubes in different colors. A complete set of Hinton cubes consisted of 81 cubes painted in 16 different colors. 27 slabs, used to represent by analogy how a 3D object can be built up in two dimensions, and 12 multicolored catalog cubes. By elaborate manipulations described in detail in his book, The Fourth Dimension, first published in 1904, he was able to represent the various cross sections of a tesseract and then, by memorizing the cubes and their many possible orientations, gain a window on this higher dimensional world. Did Hinton actually learn to create four dimensional images in his brain? In addition to the familiar up and down, forward and backward, and side to side, could he see Kata and Anna, his names for the two opposite directions along the fourth dimension? Well, without getting inside his head, we can't know. Certainly he wasn't alone in building 3D representations of 4D shapes. He introduced his cubes to his sister-in-law, Alicia Boole Scott, who became an intuitive geometer of the fourth dimension herself, an adept at making card models of 3D cross-sections of 4D polytopes. The question remains whether by such means a person can develop true four-dimensional vision, or just the ability to understand and appreciate the geometry of higher dimensional objects. One school of thought says that despite the claims of people like Hinton, we can never really see in 4D because the world around us is unremittingly three-dimensional, our brains are three-dimensional, and evolution has equipped us to interpret all the sensations we receive as set in a 3D context. No amount of mental effort will help bring the particles that make up our bodies into a different plane of existence, nor will any trick of engineering allow us to build a thing in 4D, such as an actual tesseract. This hasn't stopped science fiction writers from imagining some strange combination of events that might cause a 3D object or system to spontaneously develop an extra dimension. And he built a crooked house by Robert Heinlein, first published by Astounding Science Fiction in February 1941, tells the tale of an ingenious architect who designs a house with eight cubical rooms laid out like the net of a tesseract in 3D. Unfortunately, an earthquake shakes the building shortly after its completion and causes it to fold into an actual hypercube with bewildering results for those who first venture through its door. In a subway named Mobius, 1950, Boston's underground train network becomes so convoluted that part of it flips into another dimension, along with a train full of passengers, although all arrive safely at their intended stations in the end. Written by A.J. Dutch, an astronomer at Harvard, one of the stops on the system, it plays on the themes of the Mobius Strip and Klein Bottle, the latter being a one-sided shape that can exist only in four dimensions. 
artists too have tried to capture the essence of 4D in their work. In his 1936 Dimensionist Manifesto, Hungarian poet and art theorist Charles Tamko Serato claimed that artistic evolution had led to, as he put it, literature leaving the line and entering the plane, painting leaving the plane and entering space, and sculpture stepping out of closed immobile forms. Next, Serato said there would be the artistic conquest of four-dimensional space, which to date has been completely art-free. Salvador Dali's Crucifixion, or Corpus Hypercubus, completed in 1954, unites a classical portrayal of Christ with an unfolded tesseract. In a 2012 lecture given at the Dali Museum, geometer Thomas Banchoff, who advised Dali on mathematical issues connected with his paintings, explained how the artist was trying to use something from a three-dimensional world and take it beyond. The exercise of the whole thing was to do two perspectives at once, two superimposed crosses. Dali, like the 19th century scientists who tried to rationalize spiritualism in terms of existence in some higher space, used the idea of the fourth dimension to connect the religious with the physical. Physicists attempting to understand the fundamental nature of the universe have developed what are known as string theories. In these, subatomic particles such as electrons and quarks are treated as being not point-like, but one-dimensional vibrating strings. One of the strangest aspects of string theories is that in order to be mathematically consistent, they require that the space and time in which we live have extra dimensions. A version called superstring theory calls for a total of 10 dimensions. An extension of this known as M-theory involves 11, while another scheme by the name of bosonic string theory demands 26. All of these additional dimensions are said to be compactified, meaning that they are significant only on a fantastically small scale. Maybe someday we'll learn how to amplify or uncurl these dimensions or observe them as they actually are. But for now, and the foreseeable future, we're stuck with our familiar three macroscopic dimensions of space. <laughs>